So welcome to Midweek. Uh, this is Deeper in the Garden. I'm Mark Wethington, director of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. And I'm going to talk about uh, one of the most ubiquitous plants in our landscape. It's a plant that people absolutely love and plant by the thousands, um, had some recent problems with it. So uh, there's a lot of questions people have about them, but boxwoods. Um, boxwoods are a huge uh, genus, well, not huge compared to orchids and some others, but there are based on Kew Gardens um, Plants of the World online, which we use for a lot of our statistics on plants and, and current nomenclature, there are 101 accepted species of boxwood. Um, and they come from all over the place. Uh, the one place they don't come from is uh, North America, at least north of Mexico, but they come from uh, Western and Southern Europe and Africa, especially North Africa, which kind of shares some of the same ones as in you know, the Mediterranean region, all kind of share some species, uh, but also through more of Africa than that, and especially Madagascar, uh, Asia, where a lot of our plants come from, South and Central America, and the Caribbean. And something I didn't learn until 2014, when I was getting ready to lead a tour to Cuba, Cuba is the center of diversity for boxwood. Out of that 101 accepted species, there are 30, about 30 species from Cuba. Um, and there are probably more than that because the Cuban flora has not been as, as extensively uh, studied as some other places. And for a small island, there are a lot of uh, out of the way um, places for, for um, plants. Uh, Asia, as usual, has a lot of them. There's about 17 or so from Asia. Madagascar, I mentioned, there's about nine species from Madagascar alone. So, um, you know, it's really a widespread, uh, widespread uh, uh, genus um, out there. Now, we only grow a couple of those species with any regularity. Really, Buxus sempervirens and Buxus microphylla with a little bit of Buxus Seneca thrown in as well. And we'll talk about that. But as a group, boxwoods, Buxus are um, generally small to medium shrubs to trees, small trees generally, but they can grow to 50 feet tall. Um, they can get quite big in, in, in the wild. Uh, they all have, and I'll show it here, they all have opposite leaves. Sometimes people ask, how do I tell the difference between a boxwood and uh, say a Japanese holly? Uh, boxwoods are opposite, hollies are alternate with their leaves. So their leaves will do this, whereas boxwoods will be opposite. Uh, when I was a student, I had to go through and remember, because you have osmanthus that look like hollies. So I had to remember osmanthus is opposite. So that means Ilex, hollies are alternate. And since those are opposite, those are different than boxwoods, boxwoods are opposite. Now, you know, I can remember those things, but at the time I needed some of those, you know, uh, osmanthus is opposite. Um, generally they have, they have small leaves. Boxwoods have, have relatively small leaves. Um, so they go from, you know, less than an inch, three quarter of an inch, some of the, real dwarf ones, almost half an inch, up to uh, four inch uh, leaves. So you can have some that have leaves, you know, so big. Uh, most of the species, you know, they're growing in Cuba and Madagascar and, and South and Central America. Most are, are really not hardy for us. Uh, so most are subtropical and tropical. There are relatively few uh, of those hundred that are hardy, although there are more than we give them credit for. So um, we, uh, there are more that we should be trying, I, I suppose. Um, we grow about, uh, we grow 84 different species here at the Arboretum. Uh, excuse me, that's not correct. We grow 84 different 
taxa selections of boxwood here at the Arboretum. We grow eight species as we have them labeled now. M many more subspecies and varieties, especially of Buxus sempervirens and Buxus sinica. Um, but ah, boxwoods are not taxonomically uh, well defined in cultivation, let's say. So why are they called boxwoods? Well, what you will see everywhere is that because it has a really fine-grained, very hard wood, um, it was used to make boxes. So that's why they call it boxwood. I could, I've never been able to find anything definitive about that. While boxwoods can get fairly large, they don't get that large. So boxes that are made by it from them are pretty small boxes, most likely. And it seems odd to me that that's, they would have gotten their name from that. Uh, young stems on many of them are, I don't know if this will show up, but are tend to be square. Some people say that's where it got the name box. Uh, I don't know, I'm not gonna, I have no idea where it got the name boxwood, but the wood is really um, good fine grained, um, fine end grain wood. So it's, it's very durable, it's very hard, it's used for um, tool handles, used for uh, uh, some parts of musical instruments, chin rests and tuning pegs and things like that. Uh, because the end grain is so fine, uh, it was used a lot for um, wood cuts and wood print blocks. So early printing presses used a lot of boxwood for, for those because it would hold that. They could use it over and over and over again and those end grains wouldn't split, wouldn't um, take up a lot of the, the ink. Um, uh, and, and it was also used a lot for measuring tools. So um, weights and uh, rulers and things like that where you wanted a wood or a material that wouldn't expand and contract with weather and moisture, um, something that would stay um, really stable. So, so that's where it was often used. So talking about boxwoods, the most confusing to me thing to talk about are the most commonly grown boxwoods. Buxus sempervirens, which is variously called American boxwood, European boxwood, English boxwood, uh, common boxwood, or just box if you're in, in the UK. They tend to just call it common box. Um, it is not from America, so I don't know why it would be called American boxwood. Sometimes one of the cultivars, which has at times been, people have tried to use it as a, a species, uh, Buxus sempervirens, sempervirens, I should say, I mean, semper always, virens green, so evergreen plant. Buxus sempervirens sofruticosa um, is in the U.S. often called English boxwood. So that English boxwood, so fruticosa is kind of a, a rounded dwarfer plant than true Buxus sempervirens. Buxus sempervirens uh, in the wild makes a small tree, generally around 20 feet tall, but can grow taller. There are a lot of varieties of Buxus sempervirens. Typically it has a relatively large leaf. This is a Buxus sempervirens. Um, but there are some uh, dwarf forms, uh, smaller forms like this, uh, which have smaller leaves. Um, so it can get pretty confusing, you know, if you put these together or some of these behind me, which are all sempervirens, they can look very different. Um, even if they're uh, all the same thing. And we know these two, uh, because they are wild collected ones, we know these are true sempervirens. Uh, Buxus microphylla, uh, the other more common one, which is from uh, Japan, Buxus sempervirens is one of the, is the main one from 
Europe and over North Africa and, and over into you know Syria and, and those kind of regions, the Caucasus, um, getting to Yugoslavia and, and um, uh, Georgia, the country, not the state. Um, Buxus microphylla, smaller leaf, tends to be a much smaller plant, uh, tends to be a little shrubbier thing. It's from Japan exclusively. There are a few different varieties of, of microphylla. I think even Buxus, Buxus nurserymen often have no idea what they're growing. And if it's small and has a small leaf, they'll call it Buxus microphylla. If it's bigger and has a bigger leaf, they'll call it Semperverans. I, I don't know. Um, and I would hesitate to take any uh, cultivated plant with a cultivar name and really be able to tell you if it's truly Sempervirens or Microphylla. And the truth is often these, these boxwood growers are growing a lot of different ones and growing out seeds of them often and the seeds could be hybrids. So it's hard to say. Generally in the past um, uh, decades, many decades, uh, 30, 40 years, the goal has been to get them smaller or to be nice, tight, upright forms, get them to grow quick enough so that they grow in, in containers uh, profitably, uh, but don't grow too big in, big in the landscape, and to have them so that they don't discolor during the winter. Um, the cold, in colder areas, they can a lot of times turn kind of bronzy colored, yellowy colors, uh, and not, um, not stay real clean uh, looking. And they'll green back up when it gets uh, nicer. Um, go through a couple of the other species that are out there. So this is one, uh, this is Buxus sinica. Uh, this was one we got from the National Arboretum. It was a wild collected one. So we're pretty sure it is truly um, Buxus sinica, which comes from Asia. Like Buxus sempervirens, there are several um, naturally occurring varieties of this. So some have much smaller leaves. We're, this is kind of the sinica variety sinica form with this large leaf kind of um, spaced out leaves compared to some of the other species and um, a bit of a looser habit. Uh, I think it's a pretty plant. Um, here you can see an old seed capsule that's kind of fallen apart. Uh, this is very typical uh, seed capsule. So what I was saying was most people think that they would say that their boxwoods don't flower. Uh, they do, uh, just most people don't really notice them. Uh, and that's because the flowers are greenish and um, are small. You can see this has flower buds. It's loaded up with flower buds in here um, all along at every leaf axle. They will open to small, mostly insignificant greenish flowers um, and it'll have both male and female flowers. So the female flowers tend to be slightly larger and above the male flowers. You'll have male flowers below them. Uh, separate flowers but they can pollinate themselves. And then they, they form these little seed capsules. This is a relatively big one. Um, Buxus sempervirens and microphylla tend to be a little bit smaller and they open in three parts. So this is just one of those three parts that open up in there. Um, so I, I got on that tangent because this had the seed capsule, but Buxus sinica. Like I said, there are several different ones and there are Buxus sinica in cultivation, some of which look like typical Buxus sempervirens, some of which look like typical Buxus microphylla. I don't know. Um, it's, it's very hard. And I'm of the opinion that if you don't, if it isn't wild collected, it's probably a hybrid. Um, so Buxus sinica. Now, um, another one that uh, I find very similar and it, hmm. actually this is Buxus Seneca. This is where I started talking about the leaf capsule. Another one which I find very similar, <laughs> so similar in fact that I got them confused uh, talking about them, is Buxus Henrii. 
We got this Buxus henryi uh, from uh, Hungary, uh, a botanic garden in Hungary. And so we think it is correct, um, uh, but henryi is actually from central China. So it looks a lot like Buxus seneca and Buxus henryi should have a larger leaf. So I am a little on the fence about whether this is the true thing. We have other plants in the nursery I didn't get, uh, didn't bring out here from uh, Roy Lancaster in England. And so I have, I'm hoping those are the true uh, Buxus henryi. But again, much like Buxus seneca, assuming this is different, it has a, uh, a much larger leaf, uh, kind of spaced out leaves and it does, it is some of the, you know, things you look at are the back sides of the leaf and they do look different. Um, like Buxus henryi should, it has a little bit more of a rounded leaf tip than you get with some of these others. So this may be the true thing. Um, you, I, I need a better taxonomist than me to really figure it out. All right, another look-alike pair, which I think uh, the more I delve into, I think one is probably not correct. So when I say we grow eight different species, what I mean is we grow, you know, three or four and other ones are the same, um, is, uh, so Buxus uh, bodnerii and Buxus harlandii. So, let me write, make sure I get them, I'm, I've got them right. So this is Buxus harlandii as we have it. This is Buxus bodnerii. And they are both very similar plants uh, in terms of uh, leaf shape and look in, in, in how they are described. My issue really with um, Buxus bodnerii, excuse me, with Buxus Harlandii is that it really comes from very subtropical areas uh, in off the coast of China that I just I have a hard time buying that they're they're hardy. Nothing else that I've seen from these areas has been hardy. So I think maybe they've gotten confused with Buxus bodnerii, which also grows in in China, but perhaps they're different. Um, I will say what I have seen of Buxus harlandii, which again has these longer uh, spatulate or obovate leaves, meaning they're wider at the, the top than at the bottom or in the, or the middle. And they tend to have this emarginate tip. I don't know if you can see that, but the tip dips in just a little bit. Um, is, when they grow, they grow, they're multi-stemmed, but where boxwoods tend to grow with, our our, our Sempervirens and uh, Microphylla tend to grow with lots of stems, kind of the same size, all coming out at the base. These will grow up with a short trunk and then branch, and you'll get, you'll be able to, as it gets larger, you'll be able to see that short trunk and kind of that rounded top to it. I think it's really attractive. Um, our Buxus bodnerii is doing that a little bit, but not quite the, to the same extent. So jury's still out on these. And uh, we, we share these with people doing taxonomic work with boxwoods and we're still trying to figure it out. Um, another species we grow that uh, I think is correct. Uh, it's another National Arboretum um, one is uh, Buxus wallichiana. Buxus wallichiana comes from uh, Afghanistan across to Thailand. And our plant is absolutely gorgeous. The foliage is really thick and glossy green. It's large. I think it's foliage wise, one of the most attractive species we grow. Uh, really beautiful plant. It doesn't look exactly like what I can see as the description for this, but I haven't seen it anywhere else. And it is definitely 
a different species than anything else we grow. Also keeps these green stems much longer. Usually you get like this, one year of the greenish stems and then it turns brown, sometimes two seasons but this gets many, you know, many more seasons uh, of that green. I really like it. It's one we probably ought to propagate and, and distribute. Um, now I mentioned that there are some of the sempervirens that we know. I'm gonna get into some cultivars, go beyond the species. And I'm not gonna go in depth with cultivars. There are so many of them. There are new ones coming out all the time. But I will mention, I'm gonna mention these two because they're two of my favorite sempervirens. Uh, the first one is one that when you get the whole plant, I don't know if it'll come across on video, but it has a bluish cast to it. Um, very rounded leaves, very tightly compacted leaves. It's one called Vardar Valley. And it was collected in the Vardar Valley of Hungary quite a long time ago. It is slow growing. A lot of growers don't like to grow it because it is slow to get to growable size, but it is one of the few named boxwoods that you can put me in our collection of 84 boxwoods and I can point to it and with 100%, near 100% assurance say that is Vardar Valley. It is, it is, it is just that distinct. Um, with that bluish cast, that really round, round, I mean, it is a round leaf. Um, also, as an added bonus, it does not tend to get some of the pests that we see on our other boxwoods, and we'll get into some of those pests, but we have not had any uh, leaf miners on this, and that's one of our big issues here at the Arboretum. So Vardar Valley, look for this one, it's a low growing, lower and wider than tall, um, but I think just so much more handsome than, than like Kingsville Dwarf or some of those other uh, Morrisville Midget, Morris Midget, Morris Midget, some of those other dwarf ones. Now, a dwarf one that I do think is very attractive and probably not one that you can get right now, but we're aiming to change that, is one that we named uh, Emerald Gumdrop. And this was wild collected in Georgia uh, by the J.C. Ralston Arboretum in conjunction with some other folks uh, many, many years ago in um, 2001, I believe. Uh, we'd grown a lot of these wild collections and we had some dwarf ones from, dwarf box ones from these wild collections. And, and there was just one that always stood out. And we've got it planted here in this boxwood collection with two other dwarfs, that same collection, same collecting trip uh, from the Republic of Georgia. And this one is just so much deeper green, nicer plant. So we finally named it Emerald Gumdrop. Um, and uh, we've started getting this into the hands of nurserymen. Uh, Boxwoods have kind of dropped off in, in popularity because of boxwood blight, which I'll, also, I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but emerald gumdrop, look for it. We've, sometimes you can get it on our sales or, or auctions, that kind of thing. Um, but we finally put a name on it. I will mention there are some variegated forms. Uh, this one's uh, Aurea marginata, Buxus sempervirens, Aurea marginata. Um, it's not as Aurea gold right now, but in the spring it comes out a little more gold. There is a white margin one, creamy white margin called Elegantissima. I was going to bring a piece of that over here. And when I went and looked at it, I saw that it had uh, a boxwood blight. Um, so tomorrow, if it hadn't already happened today, tomorrow it will be ripped out, it will be bagged, it will be put in a dumpster, not in our compost tools we use will be disinfected. So I didn't want to bring that into our boxwood collection because we know we don't have boxwood blight in our main boxwood collection. Um, there are some better ones than those old ones uh, now. Uh, this is one called Borderline, uh, which while not introduced by NC State or Tom Ranney, was one that Tom Ranney helped to bring into cultivation. There are other ones, Golden Dream, other things that have these gold edges on there. Uh, 
there are some old ones. The old ones tend to be a little more spotted, tend to be not as great a habit. I really like borderline. Um, it's, it's other than I have one Vardar Valley, this is the only other uh, cultivar I have in my garden. I will put Emerald Gumdrop in, but that's really just because it's an Arboretum introduction, um, not because I love it. Staying on just kind of the taxonomy and whatever, there are, um, I mentioned there are 101 species of boxwoods. Um, boxwoods are in the, the family Buxaceae. Uh, there are six species, six genera in Buxaceae, three of which are wholly tropical, and I don't know at all, and I didn't bother to memorize the names of them. So if you go to Madagascar or uh, Central or South America, you can look them up. But the other, um, the other two species besides Buxus that we grow are Sarcococa or sweet box. And I just got brought two. A lot of people grow the ground covering Sarcococa um, uh, hookeriana, but there are shrubby ones too. This is Sarcococa saligna with these long narrow leaves. Getting ready to flower, it'll have fragrant flowers. Um, this is uh, this one is uh, Sarcococa ruscifolia, so it has leaves like ruscus. Um, but I wanted to, I got this one in particular because this is where, you know, you can really see that similarity to boxwood, except Sarcococa are alternately arranged leaves. Um, so go figure. Um, it's also getting ready to flower. They're winter flowering, fragrant flowers. Um, easy, tough plants to grow. And weirdly enough, the other uh, species, gen genus in this, um, uh, family is Pachysandra. So we have a native Pachysandra, Pachysandra procumbens, but what you normally see in cultivations is Pachysandra terminalis, which is a uh, really a herbaceous, uh, old plants, maybe semi-woody ground cover for shade. Uh, flowers at the top, there's a variegated one, there's green sheen is one you see often with shinier leaves than this, but it's a spreading ground cover um, that's been grown for ages and ages, and it's a boxwood relative. And when you, if you are a taxonomist and you get in there up close and personal to those flowers and you look at all their, their various pieces, parts in there, maybe it makes sense. You look at their DNA, maybe it makes sense. To a gardener, it doesn't make much sense. So, growing boxwoods. I, I always say that people think that the native habitat of a boxwood, at least in the US, is planted out nicely spaced in front of a brick colonial house in blazing full sun. That is where they're supposed to be. Um, God, they hate being planted in a place like that. Um, they actually, what they really want is part shade. Uh, now, people want them to be little meatballs and super dense and clipped and whatnot, and they will be denser and more sun, um, but they're incredible shade plants, and people always are like, what do I plant in the shade? What do I plant in the shade? These are great shade plants. They'll open up a little bit more, but they can be beautiful. Just the straight species, Buxus sempervirens, as this small evergreen tree. I grew that in one garden. And people would ask, what is this plant? I cannot identify it. Good plants people would say, what is this? And when I told them it was a boxwood, uh, the smart ones would go back and look and say, oh, you're right. The other ones would say, no, it isn't the boxwood I'm talking about. I'm talking about something different. I would know a boxwood. Then we'd go look at it together. Um, no, I'm, I joke, uh, but, but they really are great plants. And that's why I love this borderline um, and, and the other variegated ones, even some of these older ones. You plant them in the shade and they're, they are colored year round in the shade, in the winter, in the summer. Doesn't have to worry about them not flowering. Um, they're great plants. Honestly, 
many of the boxwoods that people love and grow, the typical ones, uh, when it's hot and sunny, they smell like cat urine. People who are here regularly know I have a terrible sense of smell. I can smell these. They have a whole host of problems. The flowers are inconspicuous. I don't know why people love them so much, honestly. There are, if you want a green plant with no flowers, a Japanese holly is a much easier plant to grow. Um, I don't know why you want a plant with no flowers or not fragrant flowers. There are a lot of evergreen plants, but I'm not here to bash boxwoods since we have a major collection of them. But I am here to, if, if, if in the chat people want to put why they love boxwood so much, I would love to know because it's one of the ones that has me, always has had me scratching my head. Um, but beside that, so growing them, other than them really preferring part shade to full sun, uh, they're very tolerant of soils, other than wet soils. They are very shallowly rooted, so they can dry out when it gets really hot and dry, but they are much more tolerant to that. Think about where they're growing. They're growing Mediterranean regions, they're growing Syria, they're growing in the, the Caucasus. A lot of these regions are very dry. Um, Less so with where the, the Asian ones are growing, the microphylla, but still, they have, but, but boxwoods have a shallow, very fibrous root system. Um, so they can dry out, but they're much more tolerant of that than overwatering. And so since they are so often planted as foundation plants near a lawn, they are often getting overwatered. When they get overwatered, they can get root rots, they, they get nematodes, they get all kinds of problems. And it's usually not one problem with boxwoods. It's usually a, a whole coast of different things. Uh, at some of the historic um, estates and managed like, uh, like Monticello uh, and Mount Vernon, when old, old boxwoods were going into decline, you know, they started off calling in the plant pathologist who looks at diseases, who told them what disease it had. And, you know, somebody else would call in the entomologist and they'd tell them what insects it had. And they call in the horticulturist and they'd tell them what growing conditions, problems they had. And really weren't able to start solving problems until they brought everybody in. It's the whole, you know, 20 blind people trying to describe an elephant by, you know, it has, it's like a rope because they touch the tail, you know. The whole thing. It's like that. It really is this combination of things. It gets stressed. It's more likely to get diseased uh, because it's stressed by insects. It's stressed by too much water. It's more likely to get insects. It's just a whole host of things. But there are some particular things that a lot of boxwoods get. Um, one, we do have in our boxwood collection. And, and we're going to put Alexander, our, our um, uh, uh, cameraman to the test. Um, you, can, you can probably see this really nice and clear, right? These little yellow spots on this boxwood leaf. Are we getting it? Um, put it on the, on the table. Yeah. Is that, put it flat or? Well, you can hold it there. It's just, it's not focusing between you and the plant. Got that? Yeah. All right. You'll see this a lot on boxwoods. Now we're going to really test them and me, see if I can do this. Oh, we got a runner. <laughs> really, we got a flopper. All right, let me see. Trying to make this as easy as possible for you. We're gonna test the limits of our camera. Oh, he went a running too. Well, let me see if I can just move him. This, can you see that? Yeah. Barely. That was what was in one of those little yellow spots on the leaf. That is a leaf miner. It is mining into the leaf. It'll emerge in spring. Maybe that'll help focus it. 
So you got the little leaf miner right in front of the, the leaf there. He's a little thing. Um, if you have bad leaf miners uh, in the spring and you go buy some boxwoods, even one boxwood that has them bad, it'll sound like popcorn, them popping out of the leaves. Now, evergreen plants are fantastic. One of the downsides to evergreen plants is they keep their leaves for multiple years. So if you have leaf problems this year, you've got leaf problems next year and the year after. Yeah, it's putting out new growth, but all that's there behind that. So it can look unattractive for several years. Um, there are leaf miner resistant varieties. Vardar Valley is, it is right here, almost touching this plant that has leaf miners and it does not have leaf miners. I think it's because the leaf is so thick. This Buxus wallichiana, while not available in the trade, never gets leaf miner. So, and some are, will, you know, some of the, the varieties will talk about that. There's a, a psyllid, uh, there's some other insects that can attack them. Uh, the, but the big thing now that most people hear about is boxwood blight. And a lot of times people think they have boxwood blight because something's happening to their boxwoods. Uh, boxwood blight will present as kind of some discolored areas of the leaf. Usually it looks like it'll be blackish, but it look water soaked almost like sunken and uh, uh, not, not dry. It won't look dry, which is what you get with a lot of other boxwood um, issues. Uh, so if you see that, get rid of that plant get rid of it. There are, I think there might be some treatments, but I hate, those are treatments that are nasty and it's not worth it. Um, probably ought to plant something else there, uh, at least for several years. Um, you know, you know, dig it out, get rid of, it. they got a shallow root system, so you don't have to dig to, to um, China, but, but do dig out what you can, uh, especially if you're growing other boxwoods. If you do find it in your garden, don't share your boxwoods with other people. Don't take cuttings of them. Um, yeah, you can have plants tested if you want. Uh, a lot of nurserymen who specialized in boxwoods went out of business uh, when boxwood blight hit uh, just because nobody wanted the boxwoods from them because those were people who were bringing in boxwoods and sending them out and it just, it's, it's a easily transmissible uh, fungal disease. So there are very strict protocols in place for growers who are still growing boxwoods. So buy boxwoods if you're getting boxwoods from reputable growers. I would tend towards grow, buying containerized boxwoods and not large bald and burlap ones. Although if you're getting bald, large bald and burlap ones from a good nursery, um, the nursery that they're getting them from um, should be certified blight free. Uh, if you success, suspect you have boxwood blight, you know, um, put it in a bag, you know, take a piece, uh, put it in a bag, bring it to your local extension agent and they can have it um, checked out. Um, and, you know, maybe consider something else. Uh, <laughs> what, what was that? Distillum. Distillum, yeah. There are a lot of great things. Um, so, uh, you know, boxwoods is a, is a great plant, but there are a lot of great evergreens out there that I, I tell people to check out. Um, we got questions? Sure. Um, Emily's saying, I've come to depend on boxwood this year to add evergreen interest to my shady spots in zone 6A since I deal with deer pressure. Do you have any other suggestions that can handle dry shade? Good companion plants for boxwoods. Sure, if you want evergreen, um, Elysium is very good for that in, in dry shade. Um, you know, some of the classic herbaceous things include uh, uh, epimediums, um, hellebores. Uh, there are some uh, carex uh, sedges that do well in dry shade, although most will prefer uh, moister um, soils. Uh, other great evergreens include um, 
uh, Mahonias, if you like Mahonias. Some people don't. I do. Um, the their re the boxwoods relatives, Sarcococcus, uh, are great, and they have fragrant winter flowers. Um, those are all you know great options. And and if you're boxwoods are another those things like roses, in that we tend to gr if you grow boxwoods, you tend to have a whole bunch planted out, just like with roses, which get every disease under the sun. If you have a few scattered through a woodland garden, your odds of getting any kind of disease, leaf miner, uh, boxwood blight, anything is, is low. If you build a, you know, a maze out of boxwoods, yeah. Okay. Um, Harriet says when she grew up in Virginia 70 plus years ago, they had a large box called a tree box and they also had a dwarf box and all were winter hardy. You have any ideas about what those might have been or were they? Yeah. So most likely uh, your tree box was, uh, was Buxus sempervirens, just the regular straight Buxus sempervirens, what, what we would what here we would call American boxwood often or common boxwood. The dwarf one would have almost certainly been uh, Buxus sempervirens sofruticosa, uh, which would have a little bit more of a billowy um, uh, shape, uh, but in, in dwarf. And that, and that here we would generally have called that English boxwood. And, and I'm glad you're calling from Virginia. Virginia has been kind of a, a center for much of the boxwood um, introduction and production and interest in the country, you know, for 70 years. Uh, one of the most popular boxwoods in, in recent decades is one called Graham Blandy, which is a very upright uh, pyramidal form. And that was, that came from England uh, to the, what was called the Blandy Experimental Farm. I don't know what it was called when it came over. It was a long, long, long time ago. Um, and I forget what it's called now, but it's in Virginia. I always know it as Blandy Experimental Farm. Um, and so it was named for Graham Blandy, who, who uh, owned that land um, before it was the Experimental Farm. Uh, and that's a real popular one, but uh, many, the, a lot of the work uh, from people in the Boxwood Society have been very active, have been people in Virginia, like uh, Jim Saunders at Saunders Brothers Nursery and, and folks like that. Okay, uh, Marilyn's asking, how do you propagate boxwood? How do you propagate boxwood? Boxwoods, you don't propagate this <laughs> one because it's got all the leaf miner on it, but you take a cutting, I usually do somewhere between three and six inches. Uh, get a nice cut on there. I usually will pull the lower leaves down. That'll often um, tear it a little bit. Dip it in some rooting hormone. Uh, nothing, it, they, they root very easily. Uh, but so you can do liquid or powder, Rutone, um, uh, uh, Hormex, anything like that. And stick it in some soil and keep it just moist. Um, it, it, you can you can put it in some more soil and, and kind of wrap a bag around it. Uh, it's not necessary to do that. Uh, boxwoods root very very easily. Um, I you can you can root them most any time. Uh, now is you're just getting out of kind of the work. The two worst times to do it are when they're flushing out in active growth in spring and as they're going dormant. Uh, once they're completely dormant, real easy to propagate. Uh, during the summer, real easy to propagate with, with a few exceptions, but not many. Just stick a whole bunch of cuttings and you'll, you'll get them going. Cool. Does boxwood have any wildlife value? Um, birds can nest in it. The, the boxwood leaf miners, those are wildlife, <laughs> right? They love it. Honestly. Um, but no. Okay. Um, are there any chartreuse or all gold boxwoods or boxwoods with gold new growth? You know, it's interesting you ask that because I was thinking to myself the same thing and trying to think if there were some 
I feel like there was one that was introduced that didn't do very well, but I couldn't can't think of what it was if it was. So as far as I know, no, but I might be wrong. I have not grown one. Okay. There are both margined ones like this, and there are ones with some a gold center and green outside. The ones that I've seen with the gold center and the green outside have not been terribly stable. This borderline has been very, very stable. Okay, uh, I thought this was pretty funny. Penelope says, not everyone smells the cat pee smell with boxwoods. And then Rick says, the Sempervirens are very fragrant to me in flower. So I guess yeah. it's different for everybody. Um, and Emily says, you asked, what, what do people love about boxwoods? And she says, I love boxwoods leaf shape, different green shades, structure, drought tolerance, shade tolerance, and deer tolerance. It's also nice that they can be left to grow naturally, but will also tolerate regular clipping. They're the perfect shrub for the shady areas in my yard, and they're evergreen to boot. It's a lot of high praises. That, and that is all fair. And since you said the shade garden. My frustration is people plant them out in blazing full sun and they just suffer. Uh, and that's, you know, I've been tempted when people, you know, when I used to do some consulting and helping people with gardens, I used to sometimes wish I could just come in, say, all right, I'm gonna replace your boxwoods with new ones. You don't have great ones. We're gonna replace them all and just rip them out and put in like a Japanese holly or something like that and just replace them all with a plant that would grow better where they had it and let them think they had boxwoods and be happy with them. Uh, but I don't. Yeah, and th that brings up something that I meant to touch on that I didn't, so before I go, and that's pruning. Um, you can get more problems. Boxwoods will grow just on the, the, the tips. You know, the tips stay green when they get, especially those really dense, tight, small ones. So you just have this layer of green and then it's brown on the inside. And most of the times, if you cut back hard, they won't flush back out. They, they, they can flush back out, but generally what you wanna do, if you have you know, this dense, bushy plant and it's too dense, the, the traditional thing to do is go in and break out some pieces and open it up a little bit. It'll still give the appearance of being very dense, but it'll, it'll allow more air movement through, it'll allow more sunlight through, and since you're not taking out everything, it will keep more green farther back in, into the plant, which will give it more resiliency if a tree, if a branch falls on it, and all you have is this and dead all the way back, not dead, but no green all the way back. If a branch falls and breaks this out, it's gonna be a long time before other branches around come up there. If you've been, you know, popping it out and you have, you know, branches farther back, if a, if something comes down and takes out all of this, you still have this here to take take on. So that's the traditional way is to go in and just kind of pop out pieces like that. You can shear them though, um, but but be warned, you will have about an inch, inch and a half of green leaves, and then it will be twiggy inside. So if you have any branch that gets broken or anything, it will leave a big hole that will take longer to fill up. Okay, uh, Steven says he has small white speckles on the leaves of a D-Runk Semper virus. Do you think that could just be the leaf miners or is it a disease? The, the leaf miners will be a, like a blister on the leaf. If it's small white spots, it could be, um, there are some scale that will get on there. It could be that um, if they can be scraped off. Uh, otherwise, not real sure. It doesn't sound, it sounds more like an insect than a disease. Um, but uh, you could, again, send it to your local extension agent. That's part of what they do. Okay. Uh, what is Boxwood's favorite soil type and soil moisture? Um, so soil types, they are very, very uh, uh, tolerant of soil types. Um, they don't the only, they don't like heavy clay soils if those soils stay wet. If they're on a slope, uh, it seems to be fine. If they're in the shade under other trees, and the tree, there's trees that can take up excess moisture, they, they seem to be fine. So they like regular but not excess water. So good drainage is the key for them. 
So if you are planting them in a row in front of your, your colonial brick, your brick colonial house, if you mound things up a little bit so that they're planted up a little bit high and make sure they're not right where the eaves, you know, the water comes off the, the, the eaves or if your, your gutters are stopped up, that that's where all the water falls and lands and sits. Uh, make sure they're not there, pull them farther out. Okay, and speaking of drainage, Will saying, if your boxwood is planted in part shade with outstanding drainage, have you observed the blight? With outstanding drainage. Really good drainage. With, without really good drainage. I, I have not, but if you have boxwoods and you are not bringing, actively bringing in boxwoods uh, or were in the past, right now you're pretty safe as long as you're not getting them from like a master gardener and I'm not calling out master gardeners, but stuff that people are propagating from their gardens and bringing in, but getting them from a nursery that is only getting in certified clean stock of boxwoods. You, the odds of boxwood blight just randomly showing up in your garden are almost non-existent unless you are bringing it in on soil, on your shoes, on something like that from a, a somewhere that is contaminated. If we had it in our boxwood collection and you came out here and we're walking around and looking at things, you could bring it to your garden, but it's not gonna just show up. It's, it's, it's just not, it's, it's gotta come from somewhere. And it's, it's not so, we heard a lot about it because it was, boxwoods are such a big uh, nursery crop and it was really affecting a major nursery crop. But that's not like dogwood anthracnose, that was a big thing, but that kind of blows around on the breeze. That's not what's happening with boxwoods. Okay, I think we got time for one more question. You mentioned that they have rather shallow root systems. How easy are they to transplant? Oh, very easy to transplant. I always tell people when you're, when you're transplanting something, if you're doing it yourself, dig a root ball, as big as you can handle. Don't go bigger. You're better to go small and not beat it up than to go large and beat it up while you're trying to move it. So what you wanna do, like anything else, dig around it. I always suggest people to dig a moat, dig a trench around it. Don't, we always wanna do it cheap and go around and stick the shovel in and then pry it up. Every time you're prying it up, you're pulling the roots apart and ripping things. Go through, if you dig a moat around it and dig straight down, and then when you get through kind of most of the roots, then undercut it. And so you're, you're picking up more of a saucer than a, a big V. Um, that's, that's great. And if you dig that, that moat and actually dig out one side, you can often, as you undercut, you can slide something under there, whether that's a board to go under the whole thing and have two people, or even just as you loosen it, you get an ax handle under there or a tool handle. You can carry one side, somebody else can carry the other side, you know, hold it steady, and you can lift that whole plant up and move it with basically not disturbing the roots system at all. Okay. Great, I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you so much, Mark, for doing this talk for us. I know I learned a ridiculous amount about boxwoods. This was really cool. They are a cool plant. They're they really are, I, I give them a hard time, Yeah. but they are, Yeah. they really are good plants. They just, they're overutilized in a poor way, I Definitely. think. Definitely, I like a plant that like has a good natural habit that you never get to see, because every like crepe myrtles. Beautiful, beautiful natural habit, but you never get to see it. Boxwoods, I believe, is another one just like that. They really are a great plant. So thank you everybody for joining us today for Deeper in the Garden. Just as a reminder, next week we will not be doing the midweek program for Thanksgiving, but the following week, November the 30th, we will be back with a horticulture hour. We will be taking questions. It will be a question and answer session with our new with our new garden manager and all the rest of the horticulture team. So please join us for that. And we hope we'll see you then. Y'all take care.